Um, I will be brief to give plenty of time for Jerry to speak, but uh, uh, Jerry Chen is, uh, is a wonderful person to have uh, kick off this symposium. I've known him uh, for quite some time, uh, since he was a graduate student uh, with Ellie Nadivi at MIT, uh, where he just did phenomenal work and a phenomenal amount of phenomenal work. He had uh, seven uh, publications uh, with Ellie, uh, all on uh, the development and adult plasticity of uh, inhibitory interneurons in the cerebral cortex. And it was just you know, several tour de forces of, of um, uh, structural and uh, a bit of molecular work uh, that uh, he finished up and, and wanted to uh, move into neurophysiology, and he picked one of the very best labs on earth to teach him uh, systems neurophysiology, and in particular optical techniques. He, he went to work uh, for Fritjof Helmkin in, in Switzerland, where uh, uh, he has been developing behavioral protocols, doing neurophysiology with calcium imaging, and I hope he'll speak a bit about his wide field two photon calcium imaging, which. Uh, holds real promise to, to be to look at cellular resolution or even finer at the physiology of neurons uh, up to more, more than a millimeter away in, in multiple cortical areas, which of course is very interesting to us. So, uh, Jerry, please. for the introduction and thank you all for the invitation to come and speak about my work and also for the opportunity to come and visit the Institute and learn about all the things, exciting things that you guys are doing um, here. So today I would be talking about my work that I've been doing in Fritjof Helmchen's lab and looking at um, long-range cortical circuits during behavior. Can I hit the next slide? Oh, here. So um, one of the, you know, basic questions that we're all interested in under is understanding how behavior is generated within the brain. How is the stimulus information a process to perform, uh, form a percept, and how is this percept then used to drive a decision which is ultimately executed as an action? Next slide. Okay. Um, so information processing occurs on different scales. You have individual neurons that can integrate the information from thousands of synapses. And on the other hand, you have um, a small population of neurons that form a microcircuit, which actually performs a set of computations. And then on the other hand, you have large areas of, of, of brains that are of a circuitry that communicate to each other over long distances. Next slide. And one of the challenges for um, studying these long range cortical circuits is this difference in scales that we're dealing with. So you have in, in, in terms of local microcircuits, a small population of a few hundred neurons that occupies a volume of a few hundred microns, and they're composed of quite diverse cell types. And on the other hand, that these areas are talking to each other on the order of millimeters or even centimeters away. Next slide. So to address this, um, I have been using the mouse whisker system to in, in investigate these lone range circuits. And so tactile information Mice use their whiskers to navigate and, and, and sense their way around the environment. Tactile information travels in from the sensory nerve in through um, the, th the, the, the brain stem, through the thalamus, and ends up in the primary somatosensory cortex, or the barrel cortex. And in the barrel cortex, there's a nice topographical organization where you have individual whiskers that correspond to specific populations uh, of neurons, and this is, people call this a barrel column. In turn, primary somatosensory cortex sends long-range connections to primary motor cortex and to secondary somatosensory cortex. Next slide. So if you look on a more fine scale level, what you see is that the neurons that project from S1 to M1 or from S1 to S2 um, make a generally non-overlapping uh, set of populations. And what I've been doing is to image the activity of these defined sets of long-range projection neurons. Next slide. In order to do this, we use um, two-photon calcium imaging, in which we can monitor spiking-related activity that induces changes in calcium concentration within a neuron. 
and we use a genetically encoded indicator here that we can express virally. And then we can implant a cranial window, which is a glass cover slip uh, sealed with bone cement that provides us optical access to, um, to the brain. From this, we can use optical intrinsic imaging to stimulate a whisker and look for intrinsic um, responses uh, in the area of cortex that corresponds to that given whisker. And from there, we can zoom in more closely and look at the population um, responses within that particular uh, uh, given area. Next slide. So in order to look at or identify long-range projection neurons, we use a set of retrograde tracers. So here is a synthetic tracer that we use, collar toxin, Electro 647, which we inject into motor cortex. And so neurons in S1 whose axons project to M1 um, take up this particular tracer, such that if you look within S1, you identify neurons that are labeled that project from S1 to S, um, from S1 to M1. Next slide. To um, look at S2 projecting neurons, we're using a complementary strategy. So here we're performing experiments in the AI14 line that was developed here, in which you, um, we can express TD tomato and cells when you co-express it with Cre recombinase. So we're using a, a viral vector of AV6 that expresses Cre recombinase, and we can inject this into S2. And neurons whose axons from S1 project to S2 become infected, turn on Cre recombinase. And, and turn on TD tomato expression. And from this, then, we can identify these S2 protecting neurons in vivo, and typically we identify the M1 protecting neurons in, in post hoc sections identified after our experiments are done. So we have three cell types now that we're looking at the S2 protecting neurons, the M1 protecting neurons, and a third subclass of unlabeled neurons that either project somewhere else in the brain or happen to project to these areas but just didn't happen to take up the tracer. Next slide. Okay. So this kind of divergent kind of stream of information that we see in S1 is somewhat reminiscent of what people see in the visual system. And so since um, the Institute is particularly interested in understanding vision, I thought I would try to draw some parallels. So within primary visual cortex, there are these, there are these could be two divergent streams of, of information processing up to higher cortical areas, where one stream is thought to underlie um, uh, um, identify an object location, a, a so-called dorsal stream, and a ventral stream, which is thought to underlie extracting information about the object identity. And so the question, next slide, is whether or not so this forms some, uh, some similar concept, um, principles that you might see in a somatosensory system. So like, for instance, if you were execute a set of behaviors, if you were looking at a refrigerator and you wanted to get a bottle of milk, you need to know whether the bottle of milk is on the upper shelf or the lower shelf, and you need to discriminate the, sh uh, the bottle of milk from the sandwich. And you can either do this visually, or with your hands and arms and fingers, you could do this tactilely. Next slide. So um, what we've did is to take mice and train them to two separate types of behavior. So in this particular task that we have, we have animal trained to a texture discrimination task. This is kind of analogous to knowing the difference between a, the sandwich and a milk bottle by using tactile, fan tactile features to extract its information. And what we have is we have mice that are trained to discriminate between different grades of sandpaper that are presented to the animal, such that we have a P100 sandpaper, which is a very rough sandpaper that's associated with a water reward. And the animal is trained to lick when presented with this uh, sandpaper, and not to lick when presented with sandpapers of smoother grades, shown here. And, th and this type of task is called a go-no-go -go task. So the animal licks in response to the go texture. It's considered a hit trial. If it doesn't lick, it's considered a miss. That's the incorrect response. If it's presented with the no-go textures, it's um, supposed to not lick. So if it doesn't lick, that's considered a correct reject. And if it incorrectly licks, it's considered a false alarm. And the animal is punished with a small timeout and uh, an air puff to the face. Next slide. So this is a video showing a mouse performing a task, so that mice are head fixed, stationary underneath our two photon microscope. Above you can see a, a light source, it's an infrared light source that illuminates the whiskers and we can track the whisking motion of the, uh, of the, of the whiskers. And the, uh, the lick port you can see from below that we can use to monitor the licking and to also dispense the water. And you can see the, the um, textures are being presented from the left coming in and the animal will, will whisk and make its decision. So in this particular case, that, that was a rough texture, so it licked to attain a water reward. This is a smooth sandpaper, so 
now we have another set of animals that are trained to a different task. This is called an object localization task. So this analogous is knowing whether the, the milk bottle is on the lower shelf or the upper shelf of the refrigerator. So in this particular task, we have a metallic pole that's being presented at different locations along the anterior posterior axis of the animal. And the animal is trained to lick when the pole is presented at a particular location and not to lick when the animal when the pole is presented at more an anterior locations. Similar trial structure, go no go task. Next slide. This is the type of data that we are um, measuring or, or monitoring. So again, we're using high speed video cameras. So what we can do is to monitor the whisking motion of the of, of the whiskers and also to look at more kind fine kinematics of the whiskers as it interacts with the texture or the or the pole. Um, below here is um, the casting imaging that we're performing. So we are using a, um, a fret-based indicator called YC Nano 140. So it's a it's a um, so what we're doing is we're monitoring the CFP and YFP fluorescence of this particular indicator. And when neurons become active, they turn greenish in color. And we're looking essentially at the ratio between YFP and CFP as our readout of calcium activity. Next slide. Okay. So one of the first type of analysis that we can do is to classify neurons that we image as whether or not they respond to touch, whether they respond to free whisking in air, or whether or not active at all. And we do this by performing a, a cross-correlation analysis of the calcium signals against vectors representing the whisking amplitude or the periods of touch. Next slide. And from this, what we can do is to look at the uh, distribution or representation of touch or whisking across these cell types and across the two task conditions. And what we see is that if we look at touch, for instance, we see a differential representation of touch across the two cell, uh, cell types. So that during texture discrimination, we see a larger fraction of active neurons that are responsive to touch in the S2 subtype population. And during object localization, there's a larger fraction of M1 projecting neurons that are responsive to touch during this particular task. So this seems to be a task dependent feature that we see and in, uh, in, in, in at least in response to touch. If we look at whisking though, we see something different. So while we ident identify S2 projecting neurons that are responsive to free whisking, we don't see any M1 projecting neurons that are responsive to free whisking. And this is consistent across both tasks and suggesting that this might be something that's more intrinsic to the circuit within S1. Next. Okay, so another thing that we can also do is to look at the activity of individual neurons and their responsiveness to particular trial types, such as the textures that we present the animals or the um, decision that the animal makes. So what I have here on top are individual neurons. So on the left here, if you can see, is one neuron whose in individual trial responses are uh, shown in, in rows here. The dotted line indicates the, the, um, the time in which the whisker first touches the texture. And I sorted the trials in, tor in terms of whether the, uh, the, the decision that the animal makes, hit or correct or check, and also according to the texture presented here. So if you perform an ROC analysis um, up between, for instance, hit versus correct or check, this neuron here that you see, it's largely res responding during correct or check trials. And then if you perform the analysis, you can see that this discriminates quite well. Whereas the middle neuron here, this M1 projecting neurons, it's this, it seems to be responding relatively indiscriminately across the different trial types. So if you perform the analysis, then what you get is that the, uh, this particular cell performs at chance levels, shown on the lower, right, uh, lower left plot, and chance level is indicated in this dotted line. So in general, from this kind of analysis, what we can do is we can look at the number of neurons that are discriminating any set of conditions ab above chance levels, just by counting the number of neurons above this dotted line, and then we can also look at the individual performance rates of the, of the neurons. Next slide. So if you look at hit versus correct or check and the, and the ability of neurons to discriminate, what we see is that during texture discrimination, there's a larger fraction of S2 projecting neurons that can discriminate between hit and correct or check trials. During object localization, we don't necessarily see any differences between the N1 and S2 projecting neurons uh, in their ability to discriminate between S hit and correct or check trials. Next slide. If you look at the non-target stimuli, um, the, the stimuli associated with the no-go trials, here uh, during texture discrimination, we find that S2 projecting neurons have a higher ability to discriminate or are more accurate in discriminating these non-target textures during texture discrimination. Whereas during object localization, we see that the M1 projecting neurons have an ability to discriminate these non-target pole positions. Next slide. So overall, in, in the study, what we find is that the activity that's available 
for sensory coding and decision making uh, in S2 and M1 projecting neurons seems to be driven in a task dependent manner in a way where um, the information that's relevant for um, um, between S1 to M1 seems to be more relevant when an animal is performing an object localization type of task, whereas the information is, um, that's um, being sent from S1 to S2 seems to be more relevant when an animal is performing uh, a texture discrimination task. And I don't have time to go into details, but we've done con some control experiments to, to demonstrate that the sensory stimulus alone doesn't necessarily be sufficient in explaining these differences that we see, that there seems to be some co component either of learning or task engagement that is driving some of these differences. There are some intrinsic differences that I mentioned, for instance, that uh, M1 projecting neurons seem to be absent, absent in the representation of, of responding to free whisking. Next slide. Okay, so following from this, then, what we were interested in knowing, now that we see these differences across these task conditions, what could be occurring? What could be the mechanism for this? And generally, there might be two possibilities. One possibility is as an animal learns how to perform a given task, there could be local plasticity within S1 that will um, produce a type of um, patterns of activity that we see in an expert mouse. The other possibility is that rather than some kind of long-term change, there could be more acute modulation through top-down inputs that could be modulating the representation across these two cell types in the, when the animal is specifically engaging in a, in a particular task. So to kind of address this first question, we um, took advantage of the fact that we're monitor, we can monitor neurons chronically across time with genetically encoded calcium indicators and to look across learning at the at response properties in these cell types. Next slide. So for this, we focused on specifically the texture discrimination task. And in this particular condition, as we're training the animals, we're only using two textures. We're using a rough texture for the go and a, and a smooth texture for the no-go. Next slide. The overall protocol that we're using is we have an initial pre-training session is when the animals are not water deprived, they're sitting there and they're passively getting their textures and they can actively whisk against the textures or not. Then we take them through training and then uh, we have a post-training session where we give the water back. The animals again can sit, uh, sit there and then we passively present the textures to the animal. And overall the idea is that if we can compare the pre-training and post-training sessions where the behavioral state is the same, they're not engaged in a task, we can look for potentially learning-related changes in the sensory evoked activity. And if we compare, for instance, an, an expert animal as it's engaged in a task versus when they're not engaged in a post-training session, we can look for differences that might be more related to the actual task engagement itself. In general, mice have different learning curves. So one, way, one of the things that we had to do is to normalize the learning curve so we can look across the, the different pools of animals. And in general, what we see is that um, there are three, we, can, we have the, divided the learning into three phases, a, ne a naive phase where the uh, performance is operating at chance levels, a learning phase where the performance increases, and an expert phase when the performance saturates. And in general, what we see is that um, the, the variability in the length of time it takes for an animal to learn a particular task is mostly this variability in the naive phase. So some animals can go for thousands of trials and not really get the task. Other animals only take maybe less than a thousand trials. And, but once they seem to understand the concept of the task, they all seem to kind of learn at relatively a similar slope. Next. Okay, so one of the things that we looked at is some changes in behavior, potential changes in behavior as we see during the, uh, the course of learning. And what, one of the things that mice do under during text discrimination task is an adopt a stereotype whisking strategy uh, during the task. And that's shown here on the left plot is um, individual trials sorted as rows. And on the, on the right portion of the left plot, you can see the whisking amplitude. So in early trials when the animal is performing at naive, condi naive conditions, what we see is that the whisking is relatively modest across the trial period and kind of evenly distributed across this trial period. And as the animal becomes an expert, you see this increased high amplitude stereotype whisking that occurs prior to when the texture arrives um, and, and when the whisker contacts the texture. This kind of anticipatory whisking is um, due to the fact that there are sound cues um, that notifies the animals that the texture is coming. And so the animal becomes alert to the fact that the te texture is coming and starts to whisk in anticipation of it. And you can see here that this increase in anticipatory whisking correlates very 
before. So one of the things that we did was we looked at the high-speed videos and looked at the fine-scale kinematics of the whiskers. And we looked at two parameters. One parameter is our so-called stick-slip events. These are high acceleration, high, event, high velocity events where a whisker catches on uh, to a particular texture and then slips free. These slip six events are thought to underlie texture coding. And we also looked at curvature changes. Curvature changes is when reflect the contact forces of a whisker against an object as it bends. And what I've done here on the right is to sort the trials during the behavior and according to the trials when the animal is whisking a lot or whisking very little. And what we see if you look at the top in, in this six of case is that when the animal is not whisking very much, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference in the frequency of sticks with events between the rough sandpaper, the P100, and the smooth sandpaper, P1200. However, when trials on the animal is whisking more, you see the specific increase in the number of slip stick events occurring in the P100 texture. Similarly, if you look at curvature changes, the whisking also produces larger curvature changes when the animal is whisking, and, and also the increases in the difference between the two textures. So overall, it seems that the whisking that strategy, the, the behavior strategy that the animal adopts in this particular case seems to be increasing the, the, the kinematic differences um, between the two stimuli that were given the animal, and pot potentially this is what the animal is using to help um, him solve the task. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of the, the functional activity that we see during learning, so we went back and did some of the kind of basic analysis that we did in a previous study. We did the classifications of, of, of neurons according to whether or not they're responsive to touch, whether they're res active but not responsive to touch, or whether they're silent. And we can categorize um, these, do this classification across sessions. And what you see here is, um, this is a summary for one animal on the right here, and individual neurons are plotted as rows. And what you can see is that there are some neurons, for instance, that, are re that res reliably respond to touch across the whole entire training session. There are some neurons that are never active at all, but a large majority of neurons are actually kind of somewhat dynamic. One session they might be responding to touch, another session they're silent. So, next slide. If um, you kind of pool the population together across the cell types, this is what we see. For the M1 projecting neurons, we see an increase in the number of neurons that have become responsive to touch over time. And interestingly, if you compare the expert session versus post-training session, the number of neurons are still elevated in, in this, in, in this uh, post-training session, suggesting that whatever's happening seems to be a more persistent effect that doesn't depend on the task engagement itself. In contrast, the S3 projecting neurons remain constant in number. However, the question is, what are the underlying dynamics? Are these the same neurons that are responding to touch over the, um, across time, or are they potentially turning over? So next slide. So we can do is quantify the probability of turnover the probability that a, a neuron is classified as touch switches its classification to something as a non-active, for instance. And what we see is that the SG projecting population has a higher probability compared to the M1 projecting, neuron, uh, projecting um, population of turning over between sessions, suggesting that this pool of neurons that here is not a steady pool, but they're actually uh, reorganizing potentially. Next slide. Okay, to look at more fine detail in terms of response properties of the neurons, we looked more at the responses of these neurons according to the kinematic features I described earlier. So above on the top here are average traces of M1 projecting neurons uh, sorted according to the phase of learning, for instance, or, or according to the kinematic events. So on the left side, I'm showing you um, sticks of events. So on trials where there are multiple sticks of events, we generally see that M1 projecting neurons fire more compared to trials when there are zero sticks of events. And below, you can see that there's a positive correlation to six of events for these neurons, both a naive and an expert phase. However, the S2 projecting neurons are doing something different. In a naive phase, we see no correlation to six of events. And when they become an expert, we see a negative correlation to six of events. In the, uh, if we look at curvature changes on the right, what we see is that on trials where there are larger curvature changes, M1 projecting neurons fire more. Um, we, again, there's a positive correlation across naive and expert sessions. And for the S2 projecting neurons, in a naive case,
again is to separate uh, um, the response properties according to trial type. So on the left plot here, I have one neuron which I've sorted according to the two textures presented in the animals, then subsorted according to um, the trial learning. And you can see as, as the animal becomes an expert, this particular neuron develops a selective response to the P1200 texture. And if you do an ROC analysis on a sl sliding window, you can see the discriminability of this particular neuron uh, increases as the animal reaches an expert phase. Below down on the right is the summary of the two cell types. So um, the, well, we, we don't see any changes in the ability of the M1 projecting neurons to discriminate between these two uh, trial types. We do see an increase uh, of the SU projecting neurons. So one question is, is this something that we see the SU projecting neurons reflect the, the texture, P100 to P1200, or does it actually reflect the decision that the animal makes? Because as the animal learns, it's changing its response to the P1200 uh, specifically it's learning to not lick for this particular uh, texture. So in order to look at, if you go to the next slide, we can look at error trials. When the animal is presented, presented with the same stimulus, but the animal makes mistakes or has different range of responses. So if we look at the P1200 texture, but look at false alarm versus correct reject trials, if you look at M1 projecting neurons, we don't see any differences in the ac activity uh, across these two trial types whereas the S2 projecting neurons you do. So you'll see larger responses to the false alarm trials compared to the uh, uh, correct reject trials. Next slide. So to summarize, so what we see during learning is that mice adopt a ryth rhythmic whisking strategy to solve this particular texture discrimination task, and this enhances texture-related kinematics. M1 projecting neurons become more responsive to touch. They reliably encode their basic whi whisker kinematic features across the learning period. Um, s projecting neurons um, represent touch. Their numbers are constant, but they undergo in increased turnover, and at the same time, they acquire more contextual responses to the texture itself. Next slide. So um, to kind of finish up in the last portion of my talk, um, so what it suggests is that there are certain elements that we see that are related to task learning, but there are certain elements that don't persist beyond the task engagement that suggests that some of the things that we are seeing is in fact due to potentially top-down modulation. Um, next slide. So two candidate sources of top-down modulation that could be impinging on these S2 or M1 projecting neurons are the feedback inputs arriving back from, from M1 or from S2. And in order to, in an ideal world, it would be great to monitor the activity across these uh, feed-forward and feedback neurons across these cortical areas simultaneously during the task. And in order to do so, we've been developing new technologies to do this. Next slide. So there are technologies where you can image uh, um, simultaneously area, uh, activity across uh, brain areas. So on one end of the spectrum, we have fMRI, which gives you whole brain uh, activity, but limited spatial and temporal resolution. On the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, single unit multi-site uh, electrophysiological recordings, which get you spiking resolution. But what I argue is there is a little bit of a technology gap in that none of these technologies really allows you to identify particular cell types that you're interested in, in, in monitoring. Next slide. So this is what two-photon imaging allows you, the optical ability to identify particular cells. Currently, there are certain limitations to conventional two-photon microscopes. So normally, when you have a two-photon microscope, you have a single laser beam that's, perform that's driven by a mirror that's performing a raster scan across your field of view. And there's a trade-off between the area of, of, of brain that you want to image and the speed and signal to noise that you can achieve. So for instance, if you wanted to image this area here that's on the order of 1.7 by 1.7 millimeters with the resolution and signal to noise to identify a particular neuron, uh, it might take you about 10 seconds to scan this entire area. However, if you're really only interested in a subset of populations within a particular larger field of view, well, a better solution is rather than scan this entire field of view with a single beam, is to use multiple beams and scan the smaller areas simultaneously. Next slide. So we've developed a microscope that's called, that we call
convergence or divergence of the beam, and this results in optical focusing. So we can install this, these ETLs on each beam path and, and uh, then allow you to independently select your, your imaging depth that you want to go after. Uh, next slide. So the last problem is this issue of if you're simultaneously uh, uh, exciting two areas within brain uh, simultaneously with two laser beams, you have a problem that the emitted photons that you get, the excited, type of the excited fluorescence, becomes scattered through the tissue. And it becomes difficult to actually pinpoint where you are in space. So to resolve this issue, um, next slide, what we use is a technique called spatial temporal demultiplexing, which Adrian Chen here at the Institute has uh, built similar systems. And the concept is that for one of the beam paths, if you insert what's called a delay line, so that the laser beams, these are pulses, um, as it's traveling through this light path, it takes a longer um, amount of um, length to travel to get to the, the, the sample, and as a result becomes delayed in time. And you can set the delay line in a way where that the pulses are arriving at your sample interleave in time. Next slide. Such that the emitted photons that you get also become interleave in time, and if you um, um, synchronize the, 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 the photons that you're collecting on the, on the detector with the laser clock of the laser, then you can s uh, properly, using uh, FPGA programs or uh, software, correctly, uh, properly assign the photons to the correct areas that you're imaging. Next slide. So now that we have the system built, we're starting to do some biology with this. And uh, we're now we're going after S1 and S2. So S1 and S2 are about a millimeter apart, which fits in the larger field of view that we're interested in, uh, that we're capable of imaging at the moment. And we can use intrinsic imaging again to identify S1 and S2 and then target our, uh, our uh, viruses to these areas. Next slide. And this is some uh, data showing you now some simultaneously imaging between S1 and S2 uh, um, in an awake animal. Next slide. So this by itself is not enough. So now what we really want to do is really take advantage of the fact that we're optically identified in the neurons. So we have, a, we have also developed a way where we can now label uh, feed forward and feedback neurons. So we're using a complementary strategy here. So in one pathway, what we could do is in inject an AAV6 expressing Cre into S1, retrogradely infecting S2, and then we can express a Cre-dependent reporter selecting a fluorescent protein such as TD tomato into S2. And this will la label our feedback neurons. And to, for labeling our uh, feed forward neurons, what we can do is use a, an orthogonal recombinase flip Fritz system where we can inject flip into uh, AAV6, uh, expressing flip into S2, uh, retrogradely infecting the S1 neurons projecting to S2, and at the same time uh, express a flip-dependent reporter into S1. Next slide. And then from this now, we can start to simultaneously image the, uh, these areas, these neurons in the areas, and also have the anato anatomical identity of those particular neurons that we're imaging and start to potentially look at the dynamics or correlations in the activity across these two areas and across the different cell types. Next slide. So in general, I think this uh, it's a very promising approach because now we can really start to look at the different cortical interactions across different cortical areas that might be uh, involved in a given behavior, not only like uh, lower sensory areas, but also association areas or, or motor areas. And from that, uh, the last slide, um, hopefully we can start to uh, arrive at a better understanding of how behavior is processed within the, within the brain. Okay, so finally I want to acknowledge um, um, several people. First of all, all this work was done in the lab of Fritjof Helmchen, my advisor, and I can thank him for all the support and, and advice and all the work that's been, that we've been doing in the lab. Um, a lot of the viral reagents were provided in, in collaboration with Bernard Schneider, who's at the EPFL and various people were involved in uh, various experiments, and I also particularly want to uh, thank Fabian Voigt and Roland Krupo, who taught me a lot about technology de 